so yeah, Keith's presentation went into the loadings portion of our event trees that we do. And then I'm the next several sessions are seismic potential failure modes for structures, but also as well as embankment that we'll have later on. And we've talked about a little bit before about the response of the structure and the seismic loads, the frequencies of those, and this is how that all ties in together. It's, it is, to me, it's not a, it is not a simple solution with that soil structure interaction. Um, luckily, we do have some simplified methods for your screening level analysis that we will cover as part of this. So for our learning objectives for this session, we're going to talk about the failure mechanisms for seismic loading and specifically for peers. And talk about some analysis procedures for evaluating those structures. We're also going to look a lot closer at an event tree for reinforced concrete. And this again happens to be for seismic failure. So going back to the head slide, the beginning slide, just to show piers that we're talking about here, typically on, on spillway, uh, spillways for dams, it could be on top of a concrete dam, it could be over in the abutment of an embankment dam. Uh, but a couple of key things to consider for these piers is that one, you have to have water up on the, above the spillway crest. To, if you have a failure that you would have an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. So that's something to consider for all these structures. A lot of flood control dams may not have water that's ever on the crest unless it's a flood. And then we don't want to combine two unusual or extreme events with a flood with a seismic load. So you have to have water up above the spillway crest. And in this one, for piers, we're also considering consider upstream downstream loading, which is where most of the water and hydrodynamic loading is coming from. But we're also considering cross canyon loading, and this is with seismic loads. Oftentimes, these piers, while they may not have been designed for seismic in any direction, but with the cross canyon direction, a lot of times these piers that are tall, slender structures, we have potential problems in the cross canyon direction. So those are. The loading consideration is upstream, downstream, as well as cross canyon. So getting into the event tree again, we've had this a couple times yesterday. Um, looking, this is for a reinforced concrete structure, the event tree. So let me get the right pointer here, the laser pointer. So here is the event tree, all the conditional probability over here, but just to consider this is showing one branch for one pool duration and for one seismic load range. So this event tree is going to have multiple, multiple ranges for seismic events, and it's going to have potentially multiple ranges for the pool duration. So there's a lot of different paths to failure when you look at this event tree, and oftentimes you want to think about this ahead of time and the well before, I mean, for the analysis, well before a risk analysis of kind of seeing how this is going to play out and if there's ways you can simplify this event tree. Um, one in particular that I've always um, struggled with or that I've never come across is this first event where you're looking at whether the concrete cracks due to the loading and then you follow a path. It doesn't crack and then some, and then you get a shear capacity failure. I personally, I've never seen that in any reclamation structures. Again, that's where most of my experience comes from. Maybe if you have a short stout wall that has a very high concentrated load, maybe from a barge or something, maybe you could actually shear through a member without actually cracking the concrete first. So maybe there's cases out there. If there are, I, I would love to hear about those. But typically, this branch of the event tree is usually, a lot of times not considered if you're talking about a tall, slender pier. So again, we're considering upstream, downstream, and cross canyon. So you got to you're thinking ahead. What's the what's the worst case? Where's your most likely failure? Where you're going to yield the steel at? And so let's take a closer look. So we're going up the up the event tree that the concrete has cracked, and the reinforcement response to bending. So whether that's elastic or whether the reinforcing steel has yielded. So when we're looking at the capacity of the member for bending, you can evaluate this using pseudo-static or pseudo-dynamic pseudo analysis. And I mentioned it before, but again, it's very, very important to consider the amplification of the seismic acceleration 
you're on top of a dam, you're going to get amplification. And again, the foundation condition, conditions matter, whether you're on soil or rock. And again, that whole soil structure interaction that gets, it can get complicated pretty quick. But for reinforcement, the response to the reinforcement, do we use a fragility curve for this? This is shown. Cody had it in his example problem. And we have it here again. This is the fragility curve that's suggested in best practices, and it, it can be altered. There's quite a, it's quite a limited range from going from virtually impossible to virtually certain from a, de a demand capacity ratio of 1 to 1 1.25, even for an adequately reinforced member. And then even less of a range for if you have a lightly reinforced section. What then further complicates this is during an analysis for a peer that's long, it's when you start analyzing the structure and you get a, it depends where you, where you analyze the section, you may start to get yielding at the nose of the peer, but then this is, a, this is a, long, a long peer with a lot of reinforcement. So that's where a lot of the subjectivity and discussions in a risk analysis comes from is, okay, you start yielding at one section of this peer, but maybe the rest of the section hasn't yielded yet. So you're, instead of just anchoring, you see one, we saw that in the exercise, which again is, a, is an exercise simplified so that we can run through that in a short amount of time. But if you get one peak that shows yielding, in that case, I think it was the DCR was like 1.3 or something for one time, but we don't know is where that is in the peer, at what instance in time, where in that, where is that in, within the peer. So as a team, you're looking at the structure as a whole, and maybe the other sections hasn't yielded. And so instead of just anchoring that uh, 0.99, you may be somewhere lower, lower than that for that particular situation. So again, that's where the, the discussion and the risk analysis and documenting all the factors and considering the structure as a whole. It becomes a little more complicated than just picking a DCR and then looking at a fragility curve and, and, and picking off a, an estimated value. So the next, when we follow this event tree, so now we're heading up, the reinforcement remained elastic. And then we went up to this branch to evaluate the shear capacity, whether the, it's exceeded or not. And so the shear capacity is, uh, it's again, it's a fairly straightforward calculation based on ACI equations. But what complicates this is the condition of the reinforcing steel at this point. So if you're, if your um, bending, bending steel has not, your tension steel hasn't yielded, then you still have an intact section. And so your shear capacity is going to be high. It's going to be based on the ACI codes. You may have, you have excess moment capacity. So you can rely, you can count on shear friction reinforcement, which adds additional clamping force on your section. So those shear capacities tend to be higher when you're in that portion of the, of the tree. Now, if we look, if we take it down the other branch where the reinforcing steel has yielded, so at that point, the steel is yielded, your section is the crack in the concrete is extending through, maybe it's cracked through at that point. So you're gonna have quite a reduced shear capacity to calculate. You may be just relying on um, shear friction. You may just be looking at that typical like sliding equation of the normal force minus the uplift times the friction, coefficient of friction at that point. So shear gets a little tricky in that it can change, it matters the condition of the of the section that you're looking at. And so for shear, when you've calculated the demand capacity ratio for where you're at, the condition of the structure, again, you're evaluating as well as moment to shear, you're evaluating that in the upstream, downstream direction, as well as cross canyon also needs to be considered. For shear, there's also a suggested fragility curve in the best practices. And this again is a suggested fragility curve. You may have a number of conditions that as a team, you may wanna, you may wanna change this fragility curve with justification. In this particular one, what you notice if a demand capacity ratio of one, so below that you should be good, but for shear, it's estimated at 0.5 if you're a DCR of one. 
And that's a new, that's kind of a neutral, the verbal descriptor is a neutral, whether it would, um, the probability of that event. And so I think that can be, that's up for discussion. You may have um, information that, you know, based on the condition of the concrete could be bad. And so maybe this is, uh, maybe this fragility curve should get shifted to the left. But there could also be conditions where you you're gonna you think you're gonna get more capacity, or that this fragility curve should get shifted to the right, which would essentially give you uh, lower probability estimates. So again, just a, again an overview of this event tree: multiple paths to failure, and this is just for one one pull duration range and one seismic load range. So some other failure modes that are related to peers. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but the gate anchorage or local overstressing of concrete is, are two other potential failure modes that can happen. Um, large hydrodynamic loads are transferred from the gates into the piers during an earthquake. And if you look at the, the failure surface that's shown there, you can get a reaction from the gate that could be what well, it is it's in the downstream direction, but it could also be angled downward, and that could create a shear plane that perhaps the pier wasn't evaluated for, and you don't have much reinforcing steel to resist that, so that could be could create another potential failure plane. Uh, the anchorage, we you, you need to look at that, and something to watch out for there is if you're doing a pseudo-static analysis, and just using a peak peak horizontal acceleration, you may get a you may get a, a peak there where you calculate the area of the steel, the yield strength, and it says it yielded. But oftentimes, if you have an unbraced, the unbonded length of these bars, that the ductility of the steel would be able to take that load. You may yield the steel, but you're not going to be resulting in failure. So some of the key factors that influence this potential failure mode. We talked about the reservoir water surface elevation, the duration it's above the crest, if it's above the crest. We'll talk about the pier geometry, the moment capacity, shear capacity. We've already touched on that a little bit. Um, seismic hazard, this just, again, touches the very top surface of, and then some tips of how do you take how do you take the seismic hazard given by the by Keith and the seismologist and applying that to your structure? Uh, spillway bridges, oftentimes, there is a spillway or there's a bridge spanning from pier to pier, and how do you deal with that in the analysis? And we'll also talk about evaluation of multiple peers. So we oft we estimate the risk for failure of a peer, but oftentimes there are multiple peers, and how do you deal with multiple multiple peer peer failure? So the peer geometry affects the seismic response, and this gets all back into the relation of what Keith was talking about and to what your particular structure is. That a, stiff, a stiffer peer may attract more load, while a flexible peer may relieve load and dissipate energy through deflection. And this often depends on the frequency of the peer in the dam versus the frequency of the earthquake. As uh, Keith alluded to, when you get those two are the same frequency, you get resonance and you can get a, a larger response when those two match up. Of course, the foundation, as we keep talking about, it matters. It's as critical to the response of the structure. So touching a little more on moment and shear capacity, uh, many of the uh, reclamation and USA structures have peers that weren't designed for current seismic loads, if they were designed for seismic loading at all. And in my experience, and it's, I think, across the board, that a lot of these structures don't have shear reinforcement at all. And so the geometry, the reinforcement and support conditions of the section is important. One example of this is at Shasta Dam, which it's a drum gate. And we talked a little bit about that yesterday. I don't know that there were any in, uh, in the Corps of Engineers inventory for drum gates. If so, very few. But the drum gate, it sits in a, at the top of the dam in a float chamber. And it's a, it's a pretty cool design that uh, it, it's buoyant. And you, to raise the gate, you add water into the float chamber. To drop the gate, you let water out. 
very few mechanical and electrical components on that. But there in the flow chamber upstream is what it called a thumb. It's a cantilever wall, but it basically looks like a thumb. And at Shasta Dam, the pins from the gate are embedded 10, 15 feet into the section. But then between the, where that pin ends and the bottom of the, bottom of the wall where you expect your highest moments, since it's a cantilever section, there was an area that had, it was very lightly reinforced when you look at the drawings. So that was a case where the critical section was not at the base of a cantilever wall, it was halfway up the wall. So you gotta look at the, look at the structure and where the reinforcement is and, and, and look at your moment diagram and see where the critical section is. And we've talked about material properties of concrete and the steel. It's very important to understand that. And again, we talked about understanding the uncertainty and considering that in the analysis. The type and duration of loading. So now that maybe after hearing Keith talk, you know, it's a lot of things going to the, to the seismic events of whether you have a short period or a long period and a lot of the different factors of where you're at in relation to the faults, what faults are controlling and how that responds with your structure. Uh, loading in each direction. So we talked about cross canyon and upstream downstream. But also, I don't, I don't, I didn't, I didn't hear Keith mention it. But oftentimes, when they're doing site specific, site specific, site specific hazard analysis, that they'll give you the earthquake in the horizontal direction is different than the 90 degree direction. So oftentimes, they can give you that information. You don't want to apply the worst direction of earthquake to a to your worst direction of loading. If you want to, if that is, information is available, to apply the right earthquake in the right direction. The, so the simple pseudo-static analysis can be used to evaluate moments and shears, but again, amplification of the loading must be considered. So moving into a time history analysis, which gets, I would say, exponentially more difficult when you move into that type of analysis, but it can lead to a much reduce the uncertainty, and you can see the extent of overstressing, and then also those number, the number of times within that time history that the stresses are exceeded. And then moving into a nonlinear finite element model is again the, the highest end, most, uh, most expensive, most time consuming type of analysis. We'll talk about a little bit later as well. So just to scratch the surface on seismic hazard, the, um, again, this first bullet point is if you don't have water up on the gates, then you probably don't have a, a failure mode that's gonna result in an uncontrolled breach. And the next, um, some spillway piers, I would, I would hope that all of our spillway piers have some reserve capacity beyond the static loading. Um, but however, these piers were not designed for significant seismic loading, if any seismic loading, and especially the seismic loads that, were, that we see today, at least in the western, western part of the country that I don't know if Keith is still listening, but my experience is every time we do a site-specific seismic hazard, they, the loads always go up. This, that seems to be the trend with new information that's out there and new data that these has the potential for higher, higher loadings than, than what we knew in the past. Um, I'm sure Corps of Engineers has structures that have peak horizontal accelerations above 1G for, could, doesn't have to be up to 10,000, and especially for Piers like this, where again, we consider amplification. Um, Shasta Dam, uh, again, it's in California, it's a 600 foot tall concrete dam that the modeling has shown that from the base of the dam to the top of the dam where the spillway is, that it was six, the amplification was six times what the peak ground acceleration is. And there's actually a seismograph in the top of the elevator core there that from an earthquake, I think it was about 10 or 15 years ago, they knew what the peak ground acceleration was and the, ampli the seismograph recorded ampli uh, accelerations that were six times what the base was. So it was, it had been verified with uh, the seismographs. And so with six times amplification, you can see that it, it wouldn't take much of a peak ground acceleration to get above one G. So shifting to uh, just talk about the spillway, spillway bridges. And I don't know what your experience is, but this is always a, a fun topic of discussion. 
when it gets into the analysis and then in a, in a risk analysis as well. So oftentimes there's a bridge that spans across the piers. It's for either vehicular traffic or it could be the hoist deck to lift gates if there are some. But then you get into discussion of does it act as a brace? So instead of a cantilever wall, you'd have something that's fixed, pinned, or fixed, uh, fixed, fixed type of boundary condition. And oftentimes you don't know the exact answer, so it's oftentimes a sensitivity analysis. You may want to know what, how it would respond with the bridge there and without the bridge there. But from, again, from my experience, oftentimes that connection from the bridge to the pier, you really got to question whether it's going to withstand the seismic event that you're applying to the pier. So these bridges definitely weren't designed for 5,000, 10,000 year events. So oftentimes it's it kind of boils down to it's more of just a, another lump of mass on top of your structure where you're where you least want to have mass on your structure that gets excited during an earthquake. And then bridges can also then impose a whole new a potential failure mode that if the bridge fails during the seismic event, can it fail and then fall on a on a gate and cause collapse of the gate and result in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir. So to talk about some of the gate loads and trunnion anchorage, which we've we talked about this um, before, so I'll make it through these pretty quick, but the large large hydrodynamic loads are transferred from the gates into the piers during an earthquake. And that anchorage is evaluated for the static and hydrodynamic loads on the gates, assuming that the full load is transferred from the gate into the trunnion anchorage and then into the, into the pier. So this is the, the large anchor rods that are embedded, oftentimes embedded into the piers that are resisting that load. And we've mentioned before, time history analysis, because of the pseudostatic may indicate that uh, trunnion anchorage has yielded past its, past its capacity, but a time history analysis that takes into account the nonlinear behavior of the anchor rod and that the trunnion anchorage actually may not fail. So now get, starting to talk about the evaluation of the failure of multiple piers. Uh, with a show of hand, how many people are familiar with Pascal's triangle or the binomial theorem? Okay, not, not too many, but this is the, the concept of when you estimate the probability of failure, we're looking at a peer, but when you have multiple peers, you do need to take into consideration multiple peers failing. So the multiple peers would increase the probability of a peer failure. And as you can imagine, if you fail multiple peers, which would result in failure of the gates, the larger the breach outflow and which increases the downstream consequences. Some things to point out on Pascal's triangle is there's an, it's an assumption that, that the peer failure is independent of the other peers failing. And I know uh, some people have issues with that because it's the, the same peers really close in proximity subjected to the same earthquake that if one peer fails, that there is dependence on the other peers failing. Um, something to note on, the, on this table here is that if your probability of failure is low, so for instance, this 0 0.001 and this table moves along, that's a higher percentage of each of one peer failing is that uh, although it's five times because there's five gates, the probability of fa failure is five times that. But if you're looking at the failure probability of a single peer and it's really high, then you have the probability of failure. Uh, multiple f peers failing, it's also very high. And a lot of times this then, it kind of, it, it, it ties into the, the life loss, the consequences. So if you have the probability of failure of one gate is low, then that risk is dominated by one or two gates failing, and that's oftentimes where your, your life loss is dependent on a smaller breach versus the high probability of one peer failing, then a lot of that life loss is gonna be dependent and it's gonna be more controlled by a larger breach. And so I don't know, uh, so a reclamation, uh, there was uh, a lot of people who did not like this method, again, because of the assumption that one gate failing is independent of multiple gates failing. Uh, 
And I'm not sure what the Corps of Engineers, if they're using Pascal's Triangle still and plan to use it. Um, at the USSD conference in San Diego earlier this year, there was a, a paper written and proposed that uh, for a, a different method to calculate this, and it considered the dependence of, of peers failing. And there was an anal analytical method along with an intuitive approach to, to look at this. Myself, I don't, I don't know for sure. All I know is that it's not completely independent, and we'll see in a case history later that I don't think it's completely dependent as well. So maybe when, we're, when I'm done, maybe if you can let me know what the, the Corps of Engineers is doing as far as considering multiple peer failures or multiple gate failures. This uh, last slide, or this next slide here on multiple peer failures, is you also have to consider the sequence of failure of multiple peers. So shown on the right, if you lose the first peer, which would re first peer, which would result in failure of two gates, and then peer number two failure, it was the, you skip one, and then you lose the middle peer, well, that would result in failure of gates three and four, and then you lose just three peers, and you could fail all six gates. Versus the other scenario on the left is this happens in sequence that you fail peer one, then two, then three, so you lose two gates, then three gates, four gates, five gates, and then six gates. Well, what this why this matters and where this can be considered in the in Pascal's triangle and considering multiple peer failures is just the the weighted life loss. And you can see on the right side because you lose you lose all three gates really early that you're you got a complete breach of the entire spillway and so you're at that maximum life loss of 164 after just failing three peers versus if it failed if it failed in sequence then the it's just incremental life loss and you don't get that maximum life loss until you lose all five peers and losing all six gates so something to consider and in either one of the, you know, you can, well, how it impacts is the weighted life loss that you see down at the bottom in the brown box is that you can, it can vary anywhere in this example from 19 people to 28 people for the life loss. And so in my, again, in my, it's a, it's not a, it's not that there's no right number here. It's my, it would be somewhere in between. That could be your high and low estimates and a mean, the best estimate somewhere in between. All right, so going back to screening analysis, we don't always have time to do complete finite element analysis of all of our peers. So for a screening level, you would look at that point where the, the moment exceeds the cracking moment of the concrete and develop an SRP, seismic response probability. So a table that compares pool elevations versus the earthquake loadings for the representative return periods. And if below, it's just below the toler tolerable risk guidelines and you can screen the potential failure mode. And then if it's above the tolerable, tolerable risk guidelines, you would proceed to a, a more advanced analysis. But some considerations for the screening level analysis is that you need to, again, keep saying it over and over again, but accounting for amplification of the structure. And thankfully, there are some simplified methods for doing that. For a screening level, this is suggesting in the cross canyon direction, you can just use an amplification factor of 1.5. Um, again, there are some other simplified equations that, that can be used that you can correlate a, an amplification. And then also considering um, if you're doing pseudostatic, that you can use in a correction factor that two thirds that accounts for, you're only gonna see that peak um, a couple of times during an earthquake. So one of the EMs um, that the core has uh, allows for that reduction factor of two thirds. And then you may wanna consider a finite element if your structure has significant um, 3D dimensionalities that are a concern that just not gonna work with pseudostatic analysis or um, you can also consider the nonlinear behavior of the structure. So here's an example a screenshot of a finite element analysis performed at Reclamation. This is showing a, um, a spillway structure. You have the retaining walls on each end, which we'll see in that presentation. But here we're looking at the, the concrete pier in the middle. 
so you would only go to this level of analysis if there was risk concerns doing looking at other other methods. But in this model, it looks at full nonlinear behavior of the structure. So the concrete's modeled as a nonlinear material property, so it allows it to crack and the reinforcement each bar or else representative bars to get the area of steel in its proper location is modeled and the the, the nonlinear behavior of the reinforcement is modeled. And it can indicate um, that the structure could still be standing even after there's, uh, you know, of course, significant cracking in the concrete, but also yielding and damage of the reinforcing steel. Um, in the presentation yesterday, I mentioned um, in the very first slide, it had Canyon Ferry Dam, and it's a dam, a reclamation dam in Montana. It's four bays, four bays and three piers on that structure. It just, the dam's about 225 feet tall, and uh, many years ago, before I started there, they did an analysis, and there were some concerns. It's a very tall and slender pier. I think it's three feet wide, and the risk was high evaluating the failure of the pier for seismic loads. And so it was high enough that decision makers said, well, we're going to go to a corrective action study. So that's the next phase, more like kind of like a feasibility study to come up with ways to fix this, put a cost, how much will it cost to fix this, and then what, what, what risk reduction will we get from these modifications? And that was done, and decision makers just didn't feel good about how much it was going to cost and if it was worth the money, if it was in the right priority amongst reclamation's inventory. And so enough time went by that, because um, the original analysis, I forgot to mention, it was done more of a linear analysis. I can't remember if it was Ellis Dyna or if it was done using SAP or some other type of analysis. But then years later, when reclamation had been doing more of the nonlinear Ellis Dyna modeling, the, the decision was made to go back to an issue evaluation and analyze these peers yet again and spend you know hundreds of thousands of dollars to model the entire dam and the response of the spillway. But from that analysis, and in the meantime, we had uh, we had to do a new seismic seismic study. And of course, between then and now, between then and then, the uh, seismic loads went up, as they, what I've my experience typically do. So the seismic loads went up significantly as well. But from this 3D finite element nonlinear analysis, we were able to um, reassess the risk and look that yeah, the reinforcement is yielding and it's significantly yielding in areas, but throughout the entire structure, that the structure would still be standing there for these remote seismic events. So it was the risk in like the greater than 5,000 year return period, maybe the greater than 10,000 year return period that was dominating the risk. And even though the seismic loads went up, we were still, when we assessed the risk, it was still right at the, the guidelines. I don't remember now if it was directly a little bit above or a little bit below, but, um, you know, it's just a guideline value. So the decision was made because it was fairly low life loss, it was less than 10 life loss, that it was an acceptable risk to reclamation. And they um, accepted the risk that, of where it was. And so that's a case where spending the money on a nonlinear finite element model um, so would certainly be better than spending multi millions of dollars on a on a repair project if they you know again if they were if it was an acceptable risk which it was determined to have to be so a case history the Shikong dam Keith mentioned it um, in his and you'll see it again in the next one but it's a it's a interesting case history um, it's a gravity dam 18 bay gated spillway it's located in Taiwan and the dam is located about 30 miles from the epicenter of this Chi Chi earthquake that happened in 1999. And the Chalungpu Fault passed directly underneath the spillway and it ruptured during the earthquake. And we'll show in the next picture, there was a vertical offset of the spillway at about 30 feet. The peak horizontal acceleration was about 0.5 G at a, about a quarter mile from the dam. And so here's some of the pictures from that from that earthquake and you can see throughout throughout all of them you can see the vertical offset but the one on the left kind of shows the the magnitude you can kind of visualize the 30 feet of offset at these dams and then so here's a you see an elevation view of the spillway the 18 bays um, some highlighted areas there on the right side is where you had the sunken the 30 feet offset 
of the spillway. And just some things to note on here is when they looked at the, the cracking pattern on some of the, on the piers, a lot of them had cracking, significant cracking, um, but it did follow where we would typically anticipate seeing cracking in a concrete structure. So it was at, at these changes in geometry, like you're seeing there in the, the figure 2.22, cracks on pier number two, you saw on that horizontal construction joints and you saw the cracks following along the OG crest. Some, one thing that I thought, thought was surprising is that the, the, the offset, the earthquake, the, after, the aftermath of the seismic event, that only five spillway gates were inoperable. And so when you, you talk about dependence of one gate failing, one pier failing, or multiple piers, piers failing, or multiple gates failing, if you had told me that one side of the spillway offset by 30 feet, I would, I would probably say that that failure was very dependent on failing all the other piers and gates. So it's interesting to me that only five, five of the gates were inoperable. Um, luckily for this case, the water was at or below the crest, so there wasn't a huge um, uncontrolled release of the reservoir from this failure. All right, that is the end of the presentation. So if there are any questions, and if there's not questions, we're going to pull out the triple integral exercise. Yeah, we're going to have right. you solve that on the spot. Okay. Um, so with a blindfold on. I need at least one question. Questions? All right, get it, get it ready. But Nobody has any questions about that very dramatic last case study that he showed us? No? Okay. <laughs> um, how did they fix the vertical offset? Like, was it a, did they start over? Did they fill it in and go somewhere else? Like, what was the solution to the 30 foot offset? I don't know for sure on what the result was, but the, certainly they had to rebuild the um, the sunken part. I don't know if they were able to save the rest. It'd be hard. I mean, seeing all the cracks that were along the entire length of the spillway, probably difficult to to save that structure. Um, but one of the notes in there is that the, the dam actually separated from the foundation in that area. The core and Pascal's triangle, are you, is it using Pascal's triangle to estimate loss of multiple piers and gates? Yep. Yep. <laughs> that is. Is the like flaw, but for the most part, oh, sorry. There's still judgment involved if you're dealing with some type of flaw, um, but for the most part, we are using it for peer failure modes for seismic. Yeah. I, th I think it's a, a good approach. I mean, it's, we don't know what the, I mean, you don't know what the right answer is, but I think it's a, uh, makes sense. It gives you it's some framework. Yeah. Reasonable results. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Oh, great question. question. Hey, Adam, so, since a lot of times you said, you know, the with site specific seismic analysis, it seems like the loads ought to always go up. So without site specific analysis, would you always lean towards using the upper estimate of seismic load? Always is a tough word. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's discussions with the, with the seismologist to do that. I mean, oftentimes for a screening level, you wanna to go to the last, I assume a periodic assessment has a, um, a PSHAW that has suggested ground motions for the different return periods. And oftentimes for those simplified analysis, you wanna find that whatever point G earthquake it is and run your analysis. But it definitely, you wanna see what the dates are on that and you'd wanna to talk to the seismologist to see how dated that is. Is it still reasonable for what level? Again, if a screening level, you may, they may, it may be fine, but as Keith, Keith mentioned, if you're going into the final design or modification of a dam, then oftentimes it is required to do a site specific. And I guess if you're looking at the most recent PA as a basis for what, for current screening, you would want to ask yourself what's changed, if anything has changed, and ask your seismologist if anything in the knowledge base has changed or uh, before just going with um, what was used before or going with a 
arbitrarily worst case. Yeah, I mean, I still, I, understanding that whole seismic hazard, I, maybe some people are really smart and understand that, that aren't seismologists, but it, it's just always, it's a good discussion to have with the seismologist, the geologist, and just making sure you understand, like, where are these faults coming from? Um, the, the Cascadia subduction zone, it's a big issue if you're anywhere in the Pacific Northwest, but that's more for a long period, which I understand affects embankment dams significantly. Your concrete structures may not be as impacted by that Cascadia subduction zone, so it may be more of those local faults that would be controlling and you'd get the most response from your structure from more of the local faults. Yeah, for the concrete structures, that might be the case. And the Cascadia is a great example of science, um, the, the knowledge base progressing fairly quickly. There's so many, many studies being done on that, um, that fault um, to understand ground motion more. Thank you, Adam.